Uh, so this is work done in collaboration with uh, Boris Burkov, Greg Leclerc, and Murad Mugan from Facebook. And this is about experience evaluating DCTCP uh, for deployment in our data centers. Uh, so standard TCP congestion control, which only reacts to packet losses, has many problems. Uh, one of them is that it can result in standing queues, queues that do not dissipate. Uh, and this increases tail latency. It can also increase tail latencies due to the time it takes to recover from losses. Uh, and it also penalizes smaller RPC flows. Okay? So the reason for the uh, standing queues is that because it only reacts to packet losses, the only mechanism it has to know whether it's using all of the available bandwidth is to go over it, uh, grow the queues until packets are dropped, and then it will slow down, right? And that's why we have the standard zigzag behavior of TCP. Uh, and it penalizes smaller flows because of these standing queues. If the RTT grows from tens of microseconds to one millisecond, a 10 kilobyte RPC can only go up to eight megabits per second, that's it, right? It doesn't matter how fast your link is. Whereas a one megabyte RPC could, it, could achieve up to eight gigabits per second, right? If you can only send 10 kilobytes every one millisecond, that limits you how fast you can go. So standard uh, log-based TCP typically results in penalizing smaller RPC flows. Congestion avoidance, on the other hand, which reacts to uh, increasing queues, uh, has been proposed as a solution to these problems of loss-based congestion control. And of these, DCTCP is the most commonly used in data centers. So DCTCP uses ECN, early congestion notification, where it switches marked packets when they arrive and the queue size is bigger than a given threshold, right? So the idea is to mark packets when we're seeing the early stages of congestion, queue growth. And the original response of TCP to ECN markings was just to react as if it was a packet drop. Uh, TCP Reno would decrease its congestion window by 50%. And in many network topologies, this response is way too aggressive. And it can reduce in underutilizing the links, right? And, and one of the problems is that it doesn't differentiate between transient congestion, congestion that may last less than an RTT, where the queue grows, but then it dissipates completely within a given RTT, right? So it doesn't, dissipate, doesn't differentiate between that and standing congestion, congestion that is lasting for many, many RTTs. Uh, DCTCP also uses ECN uh, to detect congestion, uh, but instead of always reacting the same way, it reacts proportionally to the level of congestion. So it measures how many bytes or packets so were marked with congestion per RTT, and then it reacts proportionally. So for example, uh, if, it have the, if all of the packets were marked, it will reduce the congestion window by 50%. Okay? But doing it just like that would also have the problem that it doesn't deal well with transient congestion. So what it does, it, it averages. Well, OK. So uh, to deal with transient congestion, uh, the response is based on a moving average. So the uh, markings you know, had to be, for example, if all of the packets are marked by, in one RTT, it will not react as aggressively as if all of the packets are marked for many RTTs. Okay, so that's an introduction to ECN and DCTCP, and this is about the tag. So we're gonna describe our experiences evaluating DCTCP. Uh, so we run two types of tests. The initial tests were running within a rack using the Testo, the network test toolkit, to create traffic and capture you know, information about congestion and, and the metrics. And this uncovered various issues. So, uh, and the follow-on tests were running using six racks, uh, testing some data center services. And well, I'll describe more the, the effects. Uh, so what issue did we see? Uh, in the rack testing, we saw unfairness between senders, regardless of the TCP uh, congestion control being used. Okay? We also saw unfairness between flows uh, 
even uh, with only one sender, we're using ECN. And finally, we also saw high tail latencies, high tail latencies when using DCTCP. Okay. And issues between the CIFRAC test that we saw is the higher CPU utilization with DCTCP. And I will talk about all of this. So unfairness between, between uh, servers. Um, so we had an experiment where we had uh, uh, three servers sending to one. And what we saw is that two of those servers is got 25% of the bandwidth, and the third server got 50% of the bandwidth, independently of which congestion control we used. Uh, so ignore the box in the middle because that's explanation. So we have three servers sending to one. And what happened is that the switch architecture that we were using, it has two buffers that are associated with each output port. And then the input ports are divided between buffer A and buffer B. And in that experiment, by coincidence, two of the servers were using buffer A, one of the servers was using buffer B, and then the switch uh, run robins between both buffers. So, you know, what happens is that flows using buffer A will get half of the bandwidth, and <coughs> flows using buffer B will get the other half, assuming flows are going to both buffers, right? Um, so what I had to do is ensure that in my test, I, all of the servers use ports for one buffer, right? Otherwise, when I'm analyzing behavior, I cannot differentiate between effects doing to, let's say, DCTCP and effects doing to the switch architecture. And, and I'm mentioning these things to just indicate that when doing testing, we have to be very careful to track any behaviors so that we know for the fault lies. Is it the fault of the congestion control? Is it the fault of something else? Another problem we saw is unfairness between flows when uh, using ECN. Okay? So what we have is we'll have two flows, uh, and one of the flows will get 23 gigabits per second, and the other flow will get half a gigabit per second. Right? So obviously this was with a NIC that was 25 gigabits per second. And what I did here then, I wrote a tool to analyze the pickups. And for each flow, I could look at per RTT metrics and could also expand it to look at the per packet details. And I discovered that the, one of the flow, for one of the flows, the RTTs were by model. They were either 60 microseconds or 1.3 milliseconds, more or less. Right? They were switching between one and the other one. And this was hurting, obviously, the, the bandwidth. So this is more or less what it looks like. You know? So that's RTT. The 2.1 means for flow 2, RTT 1, the RTT was 1.3 milliseconds, 1.3 milliseconds, and then for the third RTT was 40 microseconds. And then it jumped again to 1.3 milliseconds. So obviously, when the RTT is large, the bandwidth collapses. And after doing more analysis, it turned out that the NIC firmware we were using was using very large coalescent values and a one millisecond timer. And this is, these were not transparent. <laughs> Like if you look at the coalescing values of the NIC, you know, in ETH2, they were reasonable, right? But it was doing, it had a new feature that was doing something else that it was totally current performance, right? Now the more interesting issue we saw was high tail latency with data center TCP. And so we were running a one megabyte and 10 megabyte RPCs and compared to cubic, we have high tail latency. So for example, if we look at the uh, first set for cubic latencies, the one megabyte RPCs were 2.6 and 5.5 milliseconds for the 99 and 99 percentile. For the 10 kilobyte RPCs, they were 1.1 and 1.3 milliseconds. The DC TCP latencies were 43 milliseconds and 208 milliseconds for the one megabyte, and 53 milliseconds and 212 milliseconds for uh, the 10 kilobyte RPCs. Obviously, these numbers indicate, you know, like the 43 and the 53 are very close to the 50, 40 millisecond delay rack timer, and the 208, 212 are close to the RTO 200 millisecond timers, right? Uh, once we fix the problem, the latencies collapse, you know, 5.8, 6.9, 146, and 203 microseconds. Okay? So note that the 99.9 uh, latencies for DCTCP are larger than for cubic. 
And the reason for that is that the 10 kilobyte RPCs are getting much higher throughput, you know, like 10 times higher throughput. So obviously, there's less throughput for the one megabyte RPC. So the high tail latencies are not a sign that something is wrong. It's a sign that something is really, really good. We are being more fair between the small and the large RPCs. So what caused these high tail latencies? And you know, after spending a lot of time analyzing pickups, we found out that there were two issues affecting the tail latencies. One was causing RTOs. Uh, when the receiver was sending a duplicate act to the sender and not acting the last packet received. So then the sender ended up, because it was the last packet uh, in an, uh, either RPC or sometimes uh, during a, a big batch, it would have to do an RTO to send the next packet. And the other one was that under some conditions, we were delaying the acts. So we were waiting 40 milliseconds to send an acknowledgement uh, when we, sh we should not have done that, right? And it was related to the ECN. In both cases, it was related to ECN behavior. Uh, in the bottom case was uh, we were getting uh, congestion information to the receiver, and the receiver, rather than sending an immediate act to tell the sender, hey, you know, there's congestion, it was just delaying it for 40 milliseconds. Uh, and these problems were being triggered by kernel patches from 2015. They were in the corner for three years, and we didn't realize it. And I, I should mention that, that last year I gave a talk comparing congestion controls, and I talked a little bit about DCTCP, but then I, for some of the experience, I didn't talk about DCTCP because I, I mentioned I was seeing some weird behaviors that I thought were due to bugs in the kernels. So yes, they were due to bugs in the kernel. Uh, the fixes are now upstream by Yushang, Neil, and myself, and they solved this problem. OK. So uh, the next set of tests we run were six rack tests. So we have three racks on one side for storage racks. On the left side, we have worker racks that will read data from the storage. And we have the switches in between uh, connecting everything. And, and you know the, the links between the top of rack or the storage racks on the top of racks on the other side are 100 gigabit per second links, right? So we have a lot of we have a lot of bandwidth between two sets of racks. And what we did is um, we did three sets of experiments using the three racks, two racks, and one rack to test different levels of congestion. Right? Obviously, if we only have one rack, we have a lot of bandwidth on the right side going you know, to only one rack. So we can easily oversaturate the links. And we just wanted to see what would be the behavior under those conditions. So the first results are for the three worker racks where there's obviously less congestion. So the first row tells us that the maximum link utilization uh, going to the worker racks was 70%. So we're only using 70% of the bandwidth maximum. Uh, and even then, we're, we're seeing this card, you know, 85 million uh, bits being this card, which is not very much. It's 0.02% uh, of the data being transmitted. Um, and for DCTCP, we're seeing much fewer discards, right? Or the order of, uh, what is that, 300 times less uh, discards. We saw no discards on the racks for the workers. So the workers also talk to each other. So there's some traffic between the worker racks. Um, and for the CPU overheads, uh, we only saw like a small 1% overhead on the workers. And here in the last two rows, I'm saying the percentage C marked packets, right? And let me go back to the previous one. Uh, so this detection is done on the receiver, right? So for example, when that is flowing from the storage racks to the worker rack, the worker racks are the ones that can detect the ECN marking of congestion, right? And similarly, if the storage racks are seeing it, so in this following, 
sign here. Uh, the one that is, we see more CPU is the worker CPU. And that's, you know, that one is the one that is seeing 12% mark. So in the next one, now we have two worker racks. And the maximum link utilization is 99. I mean, this is over, fully saturated, the links. Like we are way oversubscribed. And as a result, Cubic is dropping 160 billion uh, bits during the duration of the experiment, which is equivalent to 0.6% of the data being sent. Okay. In contrast, DCTCP is discarding a thousand times less, and it's not discarding anything in the uh, worker type of rack switches. Okay. Uh, however, the CPU overhead on the storage racks is 14%. Okay. And this is system CPU. If the whole system can do 100% fully utilized, you know, this is not per node or per, I mean, per core or anything. This is the whole system. So there's a huge overhead. And if we look at the uh, ECN mark, we're seeing 64% markings, right? So almost every other packet is being marked uh, on the receiving end. So what, what do you mean by storage ECNT marks? So th th these are the counters uh, from, the, uh, from TCP. On the sender side? Uh, so typically, the receiver of the data is the one that says, sees the ECNT marking, right? So this means. That so the worker is reading data from the storage, and the, packet, the data packets, when they arrive, 63% of those saw congestion. So I, I, I was thinking of the, the, the storage. The, the oh, the storage initiated mark? Yeah. Uh, they're also seeing some. You know, there's some traffic between the storage nodes also, and, and the workers also send traffic to, okay. to the storage nodes. And, and there's traffic between the storage nodes where they're moving data around, you know, uh, to, to make it more available and things like that. And the final one is when only have one rack, right? Obviously, there cannot be more of a subscribe. I mean, it's like, but there's a lot more pressure. We're dropping a lot more packets for Cubic, and now we're dropping a, a lot more packets also for DCTCP. I mean, DCTCP is not a magic bullet. If you're trying to push way too much data, you know, you cannot. It's still better than cubic is by, by a factor of 12, but the previous one was a factor of 1,000, right? But we should never be in a situation where we are doing this, right? I mean, it's just way oversubscribed. Our workload should be more intelligent than that, typically. As I said, the workload that I used here was artificial because I wanted to push it, and our application would not push it beyond to this limit, right? The interesting thing to see is that the storage CPU, the overhead decreased from 14% to 10%. Uh, and we also see the percent mark increase even further to 73%, right? So even though we have more markings, the overhead is less. Uh, and that gives us an idea about what's going on, which I will talk about the, uh, the next slide. So in this slide, I will just do a quick summary. So we're seeing much fewer discards with data center TCP as expected. Uh, 10 to 100 to 1,000 times fewer discards. Uh, but we're also seeing a higher CPU utilization when the link is oversaturated. Um, so when we have 70% utilization, there's no overhead. When we're using 99% utilization, we're seeing 14% more CPU. And what we I do not think it's going to be an issue in production traffic, but we still need to thus, you know, our following test. So what's going on? Uh, so the problem is that uh, we cannot coalesce as efficiently when we are marking, right? We, can, we cannot coalesce packets uh, from, you know, a marked packet cannot be a coalesce with a non-marked packet. Therefore, the receiver is, needs to handle a lot more packets, a lot smaller packets. So GRO and LRO are less efficient. Okay. And the problem is also that when we send the axe back, we're sending a lot more axe to the sender. So it's not only the receiver that it's doing a lot more work, the sender 
need to manage a lot more packets because again, we cannot, you know, the, for DCTCP, the acknowledgement indicate there was congestion and it only applies to the amount of data that is being acknowledged. So the worst case scenario is when every other packet is, has an ECN marking because in that case we can do zero coalescing, right? So, and as, as the number of packets being marked increases, then we, we can coalesce more, you know? More marked packets can be coalesced and the overhead is less. Again, not sure how much of an issue this is gonna be on production workloads, probably not as bad, but we don't fully know right now. And I have, I had the hope of running the bigger experiment with production traffic using full clusters, but it's taken forever to, uh, to be able to upgrade everything on production to the newer kernels to do these experiments. So we're in the process of running the cluster-wide experiments, but uh, we haven't finished them, so I wasn't able to provide that data. And I'm also planning to look at techniques to reduce CP overhead when using DCTCP if it becomes an issue for production traffic. As I say, it's not clear to me whether it's only an issue for artificial workloads, but not an issue for production traffic. And that's it. So from our early experiment, DCTCP, it's really great. And I've run many DCTCP experiments in other contexts, you know, with lots of flows, with RPC sizes and all that, and it's turned out to be very, very effective, uh, both in fairness between different RPC sizes and also reducing retransmissions. Uh, and I'm also using it for the BPF uh, network resource control uh, that I'm talking about tomorrow. Uh, DCTCP is very effective on that environment. So that's it. Any questions? Uh, hi, uh, were there any tests when you were running Kubic and DCTCP at the same time in parallel? It feels like that could be completely kill DCTCP, but like, yes. I wasn't sure. So usually it's very difficult to mix congestion avoidance, which tries to prevent congestion, and congestion control, which periodically creates congestion, mm -hmm. it's problematic to do it, right? Yeah. So depending on which congestion avoidance you do, uh, one or the other will be hurt. So typically, for example, if we were using delay-based RTT, mm -hmm. in many instances, the, the delay base will be hurt unless it has a mechanism to try to detect this, like BBR sometimes does. Uh, but when you're using ECN, it depends on how you're implementing your cues, your marking on the switch. Typically, you're using red, and typically, uh, if the packet is ECN enabled, you will mark based on your thresholds. Uh, but if the packet is not ECN enabled, you will drop it once you reach the lower threshold. So in that case, cubic is penalized, not DCTCP. And a solution that we are planning to deploy is to have segregate the traffic so that we have non-ECN traffic uses one queue and ECN traffic uses another queue. So from my understanding, like basically it will require to rework the whole network to be able to support like separate queue for the ECN or for the DCTCP. So that switches right? will need to have like an extra queue, one for ECN, and you can leave the existing queues the same uh, to handle, you know, legacy. So basically it's like not as simple as like enable DCTCP on the end host, but you'll also need to rework the whole network, right? Yeah, because you always have to do it because ECN requires marking on the switches, right? So you have to do it there. But you're right in that you will need to have possibly more queues uh, to, se to segregate. And, and even if you move all of your data center traffic to DCTCP, you still have external traffic coming in that will be probably cubic or BBR, and you will need to se segregate it. So yes, you end up having more queues for that. Thank you. One thing that occurs to me thinking about all this is uh, perhaps we should consider having a relaxed GRO coalescing mode that allows to coalesce even if the, there's ECN marking in the middle. Yes. Because what you're really interested in as the receiver is that there was ECN. 
that it did happen somewhere, not necessarily... Not for DCTCP. For DCTCP... It really matters where it happens. Inside. No, 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 not where it happens. Just how many bytes experience it, right? So, ah, so, so maybe somehow GRO could maintain that piece of state as it yeah. coalesces. Oh. So I, I tried this experiment at Google, but um, it turned out that most of the time we don't have this pattern of uh, one of two packets being EC and Mark. It's, ECN is really a persistent condition on the switch somewhere on the bottleneck. So it's very rare you have a, a mix, an interleave of packet with C and packet with ECT0, ECT1. Mm -hmm. You have uh, like trains of packets. So you could add uh, some, as a general layer, something which propagate to the TCP stack. Oh, I received uh, 20 or 30 packets on, on, of which 10 were marked with CE. So you, you could do that, I, I did that, but I, I got no, no increase in performance because you also have a reduction of CWIN on the sender and the sender sends more <laughs> TSO packets, smaller TSO yes, strings. Yes. And that's also why the, 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 the extra load comes there from. There are multiple effects going on. Basically. Yeah, and especially at Google, we use micro, microsecond timestamps. So if you, have, if you are sending multiple TSO strings, they are most of the time having different microsecond timestamps. So the GRO cannot aggregate them on the receive because side. The, the time has changed. Yeah. Now, going back to there, the one that saw the largest increase is the worker, which is the receiver, right? So it probably related maybe to the, T, the smaller TSO. So you can also do less coalescence because the smaller TSO, so yeah. Any other questions? So you mentioned earlier on that you had written a tool that did the analysis of yes. PCAPs. Could you uh, talk a little bit about what that was and how you did it? It was just like a Python program that would, uh, uh, you know, like looks at all the packets and it puts them together per flow. And then it keeps track of like uh, when a packet was sent, when it was received. I mean, it's similar to what in some ways like Wireshark is doing. But I, I was able to like analyze things like at the RTT level. So for, the, for each flow, I could look at one flow and say, okay, give me the numbers per RTT, right? So I would say how many packets were in flight, what was the RTT for that RTT, and that helped me understand what was going on. Uh, that would be a very useful thing generally. Okay, uh, when I have time, I need to clean it because <laughs> it was just like a hack done very quickly. Uh, but I, I'll try to uh, find time to do that. I have two questions. Yes. Uh, uh, the, the congestion mentioned in your multiple rack um, yes. diagram, was it in the, sp the spine switch or the top of the rack switch? Is where was the congestion? Well, the, you can see here that most of the disk cards are in the SW, so, so those were on the spine switches. Okay. Uh -huh. and have, have you experienced congestion in the top of the rack switches and any effects of DCTCP on the round trip time to circle back to the host? Um, so for this, you know, there is a little bit of discard on, on, on the uh, rack, type of rack for the workers. And I also have done a lot of experiments with DCTCP for traffic within a rack, right? And in general, DCTCP behaves really, really well. I mean, it keeps the window small. It keeps the RTT much, much smaller than cubic. And, and that's why we get the fairness between small and large. Yeah, uh, my, my, my question was, do you have... You have two top of the rack switches on your storage side as well as on the yes. worker side, and you have a spine in between. And if yes. that, when the congestion is on onto the worker side, the round trip time to get back the EC and ACK through the spine and to the other host. Uh, this is within a data center, so I mean the, the RTTs. I mean I don't remember explicitly for this, but it was less than a millisecond. You know, okay. the the hardware RTT would have been the micro. You know probably 100 microseconds or less for the hard, you know, for the time to send it with no congestion. So it was, it was small. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Oh. oh. <laughs> Thank God that didn't fall. <laughs> sure. Are you okay? <laughs> That was fun. Um, one question. So it looks like the testing for regression for this particular problem could uh -huh. be you have a very, um, you have to set up quite a few things. Is there any way to make the test simpler? So to continue to regression test as we 
make changes to the kernel at so all? Net, so I, I do like rack level tests where I can use NetEM to introduce latencies and all that. And those are very convenient because like with Netesto, they're very automized and it produces really nice graphs and tables with all, almost all the information you want. So you can even collect uh, pickups if you wanted to from remote hosts and send them automatically, right? So everything. But we wanted to test in production environment with real workloads. And it's been much, much longer than that. I mean, months, much longer than that. Than expected, right? I mean, it's right. A, a pain. That's why I was wondering that can this test? Uh, can you? Can we? Is there a possibility to um, make the test simpler in the sense that? So, so I did, it, right? And and that's what I discovered the origin at the beginning. Uh, when I saw these three issues, and if I had not done that initially, if I had gone directly to production testing, oh, right. I would have seen like, oh, this is horrible. This is TCP is broken. It doesn't work, right? Mm. There's probably no way that we have cut those issues in that environment. So I, I did a easier test, like smaller scale test, but at some stage, you don't have to deploy or test it in production, right? right? And that's what right. we're trying to do. Okay. But production testing usually takes a lot longer, sadly. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much, Thank Lawrence. you.